My special guest is someone who is speaking about, I don't know, coming out, being your authentic self as someone who does not believe in gods, someone who doesn't hold to a, a theistic or even a deistic religion. Kate Cohen has a new book. It's called We of Little Faith, Why I Stopped Pretending to Believe, and maybe you should too. Kate, thanks for joining me. It's great to have you. Thanks for having me, Seth. So I am this sort of Oklahoma ex-evangelical, I, you know, I come from Protestant Christianity. You come from a more progressive flavor of Judaism, mm -hmm. but you, did you ever buy it? I mean, even, were you always smarter than me? Like, cause I was reading your book and I'm like, <laughs> God, she figured it out early. I mean, what's that like? So flesh it out, you know, it, you as in a reformed mm -hmm. Jewish culture as a non-believer. Well, I didn't think of myself that way. I didn't, I, I was a, um, you know, a cute little, um, kid in a, in a, in a, you know, dress up clothes for when we went to synagogue and I had my bat mitzvah and, um, said my prayers and my Torah portion and sang, um, uh, sang the songs. And, um, it, you know, I didn't, and I think maybe it's because I grew up in a very bookish family, a very literary family. My uh, dad's an English professor. Um, I just associated the God that we kept reading about with the characters in books that I loved. You know, it was just a character, fascinating character, as I said. And um, so now I'm believing. I didn't think to myself, I'm an atheist. You know, that took a little bit longer. Um, and I didn't tell anyone or ask anyone, honestly, like, do you really think that there's really somebody listening to our prayers? Do you really think these things? I just sort of kept it all uh, in my head. Yeah, okay. Um, but I mean, did you not speak out because there was a stigma or did you not speak out because it was a non-issue and it wasn't even on your radar? I did not speak out because... I was a get along kind of a kid, you know, I, I guess that that would have been like impolite <laughs> or rude. Really? Um, I think that that is a lot of why people don't speak out, don't bring it up, you know, no matter what they actually think, you know, we sort of nod and smile and, and um, do what our families are doing or what our, you know, grandparents expect us to do. And, um, and a lot of it comes from this very, I don't know, I guess it sounds small, but it is in a way a very large sort of social pressure to, you know, to be, to be liked, to be a part of everything and not to set yourself apart or aside from other people. I talk yeah. to a lot of people in, uh, and please forgive my audience for hearing this the 500th time. <laughs> But I always talk about the difference between peace and an absence of conflict. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times we sit on our hands and we're not speaking our authentic selves to other people to keep the peace. But it's not really peace because everybody else's, their authentic selves. We just want to avoid conflict. And so we sort of play this double standard where everybody else gets the rights that we do not. And it doesn't sound like you were in a, you know, hyper judgmental kind mm -mm. of a culture at all. No, but I am interested in that. But Go ahead. I, you know, I think it's very interesting that you say that everyone else is get to express their authentic selves. Are we, are we sure about that? You know, uh, I mean, sometimes I think about myself, you know, uh, sitting in synagogue, um, and, you know, saying the prayers that I was supposed to say, which are really just all in praise of this Old Testament God. And um, assuming that everybody around me did believe, I didn't believe, but that was okay. I, I could, you know, I could go with that. But did they? Do they? You know, I, 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 I think it's fascinating that we assume that, that people believe what they what they appear to believe or what they say, because like you never know what's especially what if your we is. have the, yeah. exactly, especially we ourselves have the experience of not having believed. You would think that that would, 
you know, tip you off. Um, so yeah, I, uh, I, in my, in my book, I'm really trying to encourage people. I, I'm really not trying to get people to give up God. If God is something that they have in their lives and they, um, you know, feel, um, genuinely, um, that they believe. I'm really trying to get people who don't believe to sort of face that in themselves, be honest about it with other people um, as much as possible. So I'm reading your book mm -hmm. and I, this is a weird flash, but I do have a connection I'm going to make here. Oh, good. When I was, I was a Christian radio host for 12 years. Okay. Mm -hmm. And the station played Christian music and we did Christian stuff. And our target audience was females, 18 to 34. And the reason we went after that demographic is because, first of all, the women usually controlled the radio in the car, which meant we got the husband and kids by default, right? Mm -hmm. But secondly, we were hitting a demographic that was often uh, starting a family. And so the mothers would be like, I have a child. We need to get back in church, right? right this is right. what we need to do. Our children need to be involved in church. Now, I've been lax, but now I have to re-engage. And we, right. we saw that. But I'm reading your story and I'm going, that's not that. Like, like your story was different. So flesh it out for me, Kate. Yeah. Well, no, I think you're absolutely right. That is a time when, you know, somebody who maybe when they were in college or a young adult didn't go to church, didn't go to synagogue, and then they're starting a family and they think, oh yeah, I got to do this, this, this part of life. I've got to pass on these beliefs. Uh, I have to return to my faith community. And I really had the exact opposite uh, response. My feeling when I had children was, okay, this is where it stops. This is where these kind of, you know, half fleshed out ideas, these half beliefs, these completely non-beliefs, this is where I, I, I'm not passing them on. I'm gonna tell them what I really think um, because they're these tiny creatures trying to figure out how the world works. And the idea to me of putting something in their heads that I didn't think was true was um, like actually kind of repugnant. <laughs> I couldn't sure. do it. I couldn't do it. So um, that is when I, you know, I say my children made me an atheist. And that is why, because I could not um sort of keep going with the with the pretense um e e you know yeah i couldn't keep going with the pretense all right um, well devil's advocate and I, time yeah you yeah, just indoctrinated good. your children with atheism right? <laughs> yes. i mean instead of indoctrinating them with religion you brainwash them to be an atheist that would mm -hmm. be one of the the pushbacks you might hear so yeah you want to speak to that i mean i think that it's true to the extent that um, when they're little and you are really the source for everything they know about the world, you have incredible power to sort of shape their worldview. I mean, and I do not uh, dispute that I had that kind of power. I felt that it was my responsibility to teach them all kinds of things about how to behave toward one another, about um, you know, what we owe to the most vulnerable among us. I mean, all, all, all everything. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, indoctrination, I guess, but <laughs> <laughs> I'm not really totally un uncomfortable with that. And I will only say that I never tried to keep any information from them. They can read all, they can learn all they want about religion. Uh, you know, I hope that they do. Um, I never, shut them down when they wanted to have a conversation. I never, you know, so uh, yes, I absolutely told them that God was a human invention um, and that religions were, you know, systems people created in order to explain the world to themselves. Um, and they, as you know, having learned that as children, they are much less likely to, um, kind of become religious than if they, they hadn't. 
I'm going okay to come to your defense just a little <laughs> bit here. Oh, okay. Um, because I, I do think, I mean, I understand uh, you're saying, I, I think this is, this is untrue. This is a man-made construct, et yes. cetera, but not uh, punishing them for exploration, curiosity, questions, other ideas, uh, mm-hmm. you know, fostering that I think is really more of a how to think instead of what to think uh, model. So I, you know, I, I don't think indoctrination is the word. Maybe I'm just biased. It's very possible. I'm just showing this conversation favoritism because you are, you know, you're teaching them that the world isn't comprised of gods and monsters, you know, but that these are human made constructs. I don't know. I, I just mm-hmm. wanted to come to your defense for just a second. Kate. I, I mean, I did teach them what to think, but, but I would say that we teach our kids what to think about all kinds of things, you know, we, and, um, and I really don't see the distinction, you know, why I shouldn't have taught them what to think about this particular uh, subject. So it's it's up there with don't steal, look both ways before you cross the street. Absolutely. The earth is round. The the country has 50 States, you know, uh, um, the, 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 the distinction with God is that, you know, it's very hard to prove that there isn't this imaginary thing, that this imaginary thing doesn't exist. But I'm okay with that. I can't prove that there aren't, you know, monsters under their bed. I can't prove that there aren't fairies in the garden, all that stuff. I'm okay saying, but there aren't. I'm okay with that. Speaking Certainty. here with uh, author Kate Cohen. She has a new book called We of little faith, why I stopped pretending to believe, and maybe you should too. I'm very charitable with people who are flying Mm -hmm. under the radar because I myself did for years, but I have heard the pushback that if you aren't authentic, if you don't stand on the hill and shout it, if you aren't saying it publicly, I Mm -hmm. think it's a bunch of crap. I do not believe that Mm -hmm. you are either a sellout or a coward. How would you address that claim? You mean that atheists have to be? Like if um, you aren't speaking out, mm-hmm. you, you're you part of the problem. I am very sympathetic to um, people who want to keep it to themselves. Uh, I did for for many, many years. And the the stakes for me, we're so incredibly low. You know, I live in the Northeast. I work at home. Uh, My family all knew, you know, what I believed. Um, And still, it took me a long time to be able to sort of have that awkward conversation or be willing to share um, something that is, let's face it, still quite countercultural. So I would say... Yes, it does make it harder for other people to be honest if you're not being honest. Um, but that is a reason for people like me, you know, for whom the risks and the are, are very low, you know, and the consequences would be minimal. That is a reason for people like me to um, to be honest and to take that step because there's people. I don't know, probably in your neck of the woods um, there's, and certainly in other countries, but there's people who just can't, at, you know, it would be a risk to them physically. It would be a, a risk to their careers. It would be a risk to their children. And I'm, I, I, I don't think, I don't think they need to take that step. I think people like me should take that step. You know, oh, we, I, I have the Look, responsibility. I'm, I'm in strawberry red, Oklahoma. Yeah. Uh, atheists have to crawl from point A to point B in the <laughs> prone position, right? I mean, it's just, it's there. You throw a rock and hit three churches. There's MAGA flags everywhere. It's yeah. just crazy, you know? So, right. but I mean, I do find um, I am a, in a position of relative privilege. It's not like I was born in freaking Saudi Arabia and an apostate there. Absolutely. You know, I don't worry for my physical safety really as much. Um, so yeah, I, I feel like, well, maybe... Maybe it can provide a, a rallying point for other people in 
Bible Belt states. So, uh, right. I think I think it's absolutely an argument for people who have privileges in other ways, who are white, who are you know uh, middle class, who are you know whatever it is, whatever whatever um, kind of extra legs up we have um, yeah. and extra leeway we have. We, we absolutely have a responsibility because there are people for whom um, it would be too risky. And I don't, I'm not asking people to take that risk. I, I would love it if people could take it at least within the con confines of their heads and their, their families. You know, I l would love it if people could have honest conversations with their children um, because just because I know how incredibly rewarding that can be that kind of honesty. Um, but out in the world, uh, I'm not, yeah, I'm not asking people to take huge risks. She's not judgy. She's not judging us. <laughs> oh, no, wait, I didn't say that, <laughs> but I'm not judgy <laughs> about this particular thing. So I'm reading in your book about mm -hmm. uh, religious holidays. I don't know, Easter, Christmas. Come on. Do you celebrate? Do you, do you get into those things? Uh, I really like Christmas. <laughs> yeah, me too. I really like, yeah, it's a, it's a great one. Um, I, you know, holidays are, so the second part of my book, um, the first part of my book is my very undramatic, but I think totally relatable kind of coming out story where I shift in, into being able finally to, to say that I'm an atheist. Um, and it's the story of, of how becoming a parent really pushed me along in that direction. And it answers a few questions about like why I'm not an agnostic and things. The second part is really about, okay, now I've sort of set my family on this, this journey. There's a lot about religion that's wonderful that, you know, I mean, the rituals that help you mark the passage of time, the the holidays that help you sort of celebrate what's great about your surroundings, the, you know, churches, I love churches. Um, and of course, dealing with the question of death, dealing with morality, these are all things that we have to be able to do without this um, structure. If, if, you know, if we want to live a full life. So, uh, yeah, so there's a chapter on, on holidays. Um, and, but if I may my, and forgive the interruption, yeah. but that's yeah. just what I do. Kate, have you mm -hmm. noticed that even with the Jesus is the reason for the season holiday of Christmas, <laughs> most of the stuff we do with Christmas has nothing to do with Christ. I mean, the gifts and the tree and the wrapping and the, and the tinsel and the lights and, and uh, the family and the turkey and all those other things right. are really more about humanity or traditions that aren't linked directly to the Christian tradition. I always found that fascinating. Have you sort of taken that journey in your brain? I mean, all of these, I mean, so many of these Christian holidays are repurposed pagan holidays anyway. I mean, clearly it's it comes from this human need um, that predates Christianity. Um, so sure, you know, and then, and then that's a, that's you know, a lot of people celebrate Christmas and think to themselves, well, it doesn't matter. It's just a pagan holiday anyway, or it doesn't, you know, I think Jesus was actually born in the summer sometime and, you know, <laughs> yes, Santa has nothing to do with whatever. Uh, so yeah. yes, that is certainly one way to look at it. Like it isn't really about Christmas, but there is also or it's not really about Chris, Christianity. It's not really about Christ, but there is also, um, there is probably a, a deeper level of experiencing that holiday that uh, as a Jewish atheist, I, you know, I can't access and I wish that I could, you know, so a uh, part of what I talk about in that chapter is sort of my search for a holiday um, that really expressed something I believe that wasn't just fun and also a kind of a communal thing, which Christmas is. I mean, you know, the whole, the whole world is doing something on, on Christmas relating to Christmas or not the whole world, the whole country at least is you. doing something on Christmas related to Christmas. And, um, 
And it's nice to be a part of that, uh, even if it's, you know, going with other Jews to a Chinese restaurant or something. It's nice to sort of be, live in reference to other human beings. Um, so I, you know, I was kind of searching for a holiday that allowed me to feel connected to my neighbors, but also feel that I was expressing um, my own beliefs. And, uh, and that was definitely a journey that I that I talk about. I cannot believe I'm going to open this can of worms, but I heard you say Ooh. atheist, agnostic, et cetera, et cetera. I've been watching and I, I don't engage, but people get so hung up on labels and I understand mm -hmm. the usefulness of labels. I mean, yeah. they help in some ways, but we can also, it's also like a playground of pedantry after a while. Are you agnostic? Are you atheist? Mm -hmm. Are you an atheist agnostic or agnostic agnatheist? Or are you a seeker <laughs> or all these other things? Do you ever get into that? Like, are you know, I all like I think if you don't know, you don't believe. But do you ever get into the conversations about labels and and what we call ourselves? Yeah, I think it's really. I mean, um, I, I guess it's you know. It, look at it, you it walking softly. Divisive. Look at you walking no, softly no, 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 on no. this topic. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I just was sort of like, I enjoy talking about words and what they mean. So it pedantry, I guess, but you know. Well, no, no, no. Way, I mean, I'm not saying that it's the, just like you and I are having yeah. a discussion about yes, it. But right, I'm talking right, right. about those who will argue yeah. for days on Twitter yes, about yes, it. Yes, yes, It seems you know, it's like almost like, I think are, it's are you spiritual? If someone yeah. says I'm spiritual, I usually yeah. stop. And instead of going after them and say, what the hell are you talking about? You're an atheist. I say, well, define what spiritual means to you. I, I, because for Seth, a lot of people. I got to tell you, I have never understood that word. Does it just mean <laughs> that you <laughs> don't think that life is confined to the things you see in front of you? I honest to goodness, I'm totally with you. I now, here's my take on it. No, no, no. I, here's I, my I, take. Okay. Okay. Uh, for you and I are talking over each other because I think we're both like sitting at the table. Uh, yeah. You want to finish your thought and I'll jump in. Go ahead. Go ahead. Well, no, I was just going to talk about the question of being an agnostic because. Okay. Well, I'll speak to spiritual okay. and then because that was the detour. I think a lot of people are groping for descriptives for what they see as sort of a transcendent mm -hmm. experience and they don't have or don't know language to better describe it. They're not speaking about an actual spiritual membrane or aura etc mm -hmm. they're saying you know i'm spiritual in the sense that i can look at the the beauty of nature the birth of a beautiful child the love i have for my partner etc and i don't have other language to talk about that so spiritual becomes kind of the i don't know the, the putty that binds yeah. all that but i you know i again that's a i think i have to deter i ask them to define what they mean by spiritual and i know i think I, some people use the word god in the same way you know, and that kind of drives me a little bit nuts, honestly, because <laughs> <laughs> because it's like, OK, you're talking about human connectedness or you're talking about that sense of wonder that you have when you're, you know, watching a beautiful sunset or listening to an incredible piece of music. But if you call it God, you're kind of confusing the issue, I think. Um, you know, at least in this country where we have people who think that there is a supreme being who's looking down on us and, you know, caring whether who we have sex with and things like that. I mean, I, I feel I understand that people want a big word to describe big feelings, but I think using that same word uh, gives their God too much power so i so i really say even the strongly... non-believer is invoking god for the transcendent yeah so oh, yes i believe in god but i believe in this kind of you know oneness or human connectedness or something yeah, when they don't you know i i i that's how i feel about that that okay. word all right well as far as the uh but, the labels beyond yeah. that so i'll let you speak to that since i'm the one who teed you up go ahead atheist agnostic <laughs> whatever what do you think when I first started telling people, I got the courage to sort of tell people outside my little family um, that I was an atheist. I got a lot of, well, you mean you're an agnostic, right? Because I think people really want to, they really, what they really didn't like was my certainty. They didn't like the certainty. Um, and I think that even believers 
who have some doubts can kind of understand the agnostic. Like, I, I don't, you know, I, I'm not going to, I'm not going to decide this question. I don't know. And I just never, I, I don't see, I don't, it's not like I see some evidence for the existence of God and some evidence against the existence of God. I don't see any evidence for the real existence of God beyond, you know, as a human concept. So, um, so I just never, I never had, I mean, I had the urge to call myself an agnostic because I'm a, I'm a nice person who knows <laughs> there's a lot of stuff I don't know, but I never, I never went down that, that route. No. It's made up. It's a polarizing word. I mean, if you walk in, like I'll have a cost mm, benefit yeah. depending on my, my audience. Yeah. Well, I'm not a religious person or I'm, right. you know, I'm a former religious person. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of times, and, and some would call that conciliatory, but I find it's, it's more strategic. I'm playing chess, trying to make sure that I'm not using a term that will shut them down when the truth is I might be interested in a way in a conversation. Um, so, right. You know, and what it, I'm again, trying to do, yeah. Go ahead. I'm trying to get people. I I would like people to take that that sort of sting and stigma out of the word of out of the word atheism in a way because I I feel like there are so many non-believers out there, and um, if 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 we could coalesce around a single word, I feel like that would really help. Or a single name, I think that would really help in terms of, you know, any kind of um, sense of community or even um, potentially political, you know, political power. Um, but no, we don't. Yeah, disagree. I agree. I mean, you're, tough, you're yeah. talking to a host of a site and online global community called The Thinking Atheist. So, <laughs> I mean, I I get it, you know, and I I, yeah. I buy that. I think it's it's a word that should be used certainly out there. Mm -hmm. um, before we, you know, I want you to kind of pitch the book uh, for one last time, you know, and and kind of encourage people to that end and that direction. I'll include the link in the description box, but. Um, your family, or your kids, are they sort of skeptics, non-religious today? How's that working for you? Um, they're all. Don't they're let all me trespass there. now. They left, this they is left my house. <laughs> okay. No, my, right. my nest is newly empty. Um, okay. So that's the only tender part. <laughs> uh, but that. yeah, no, they are totally, um, they are atheists. And, um, you know, I... I had a conversation recently with um, a friend of mine who's a pastor and she read my book. I read her book and she said, you know, I'm really curious how you would react if one of your children became religious. And I, 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 they happened to be still in the house at that point. So I went and said that to, to them, what that she had said that, and they just laughed, <laughs> wow. but I not, I, you know, they, they, to them, again, it's sort of similar. It's like, it would be like suddenly believing that Peter Pan was real or something like that. They just don't, they don't see it that way, but they are, I, I hope, I know, I believe like me, um, sympathetic to the religious impulse. They are curious people. They are, you know, um, they're open-minded. They are very politically sort of active and savvy. Um, and they love, they love arts and, um, kind of talking about books and movies and all those things. They sort of, they, they really appreciate the art of, of uh, creation. They love fiction. It's not that they don't love things that aren't strictly factual. Um, yeah. They just know their fiction. So, yeah. They're engaged yeah. in the world. And They're I think the world, the world. Of, of human mm -hmm. imagination and creativity and arts and, you know, all those types of things. I think that's part of the human existence as well. I don't know. Has the book been out long enough for you to get the apologist in your inbox explaining why you're wrong? <laughs> I mean, are people praying for you? Are they sending you those types of correspondence oh, chats? Well, the interesting thing about being Jewish is people have been praying for me for my whole life. <laughs> <laughs> so that that's not going to be a change. But so, okay, all right. Well, um, I'm I, sure. I but you know, copy. there are <laughs> there are a lot. Uh, I mean, I have um, had several pieces in the Washington Post about about these issues, and um, when those come out, 
I cannot tell you how incredibly, um, I don't know, uh, reassuring and confirming it is. Um, how many people are so happy to have that voice expressed in the, you know, a legacy media, and how few negative things. I mean, in the comments on the column may be negative. But the letters that I actually get um, are really positive and really from a lot of people who feel sort of seen and um, yeah. uh, represented. Uh, so I'm hoping that the same thing happens um, with a book. I think I think that it will. I think that um, it's already, or at least my sort of my ventures into this topic have already. Um, sort of touched a nerve with people who, you know, don't necessarily want to be professional atheists, um, but who would love that freedom to be um, honest with their families and, and honest with, you know, their, their friends and their communities. So I get a lot of that. We'll see. Yeah, it's funny. My yeah. inbox is, uh, I haven't told anybody yet, but thank you. Yeah. You know, or, or I'm yeah, a black exactly. sheep and I've, I don't feel connection. And yet I, now I feel validated that I wasn't right. the only one. And, right. And I wasn't the only one. I was sitting in my little, you know, in my synagogue, in my little town in Virginia, I wasn't the only one yeah. who was sitting there thinking, okay, it's a metaphor <laughs> right. or, okay, this is a character or, you know, that's interesting, this tradition, but not at all. Like someone was listening to my, you know, middle school concerns. Um, so, all right. Yeah. Well, give I'm me hoping... a, give me a final brochure on the book as I uh, link it in the description box, but tell people what they're in for. If you would. Uh, you're in for a very entertaining read about someone who chose to raise her children as atheists and who sort of struggled with providing them everything that uh, religion is at least theoretically supposed to provide us. And I think I came up with some pretty good um, solutions. And I also think that the book might inspire some people who have been unwilling to commit to the question of being atheist or not, to go ahead and speak their truth and um, enjoy that um, that reward of living an authentic life um, that you can get when you're when you're honest with yourself. If you say it out loud, make sure you look mm -hmm. around. You might just be surprised. Yeah, well, <laughs> it's true. As there are, you know, that's a good feeling. We of little faith, why I stopped pretending to believe, mm -hmm. and maybe you should too. The new book by Kate Cohen. You're a joy to speak with. All success with the book. I hope it goes Thank out you. there and just changes the lives of people. And we'll keep uh, sort of spreading the word on our end. Okay. Sounds great. Lovely Thank to you. talk to you.